Hello and welcome to a very special, slightly different start to the Friday stream because slightly before I went live and the reason I'm weirdly positioned on the screen, I'll just edit that while we're doing this, <laughs> is because the, uh, so it would be that one, there we go. That's a bit better. There we go. Move me over a bit. That's better. Uh, yes, yeah, so slightly before I went live, I don't know how long, because I've had a bit of a day, um, and I don't know whether it could have been posted hours ago, but I have not um, only just seen it, basically, before the stream, and it's in the background here. Look, this is it. Uh, basically, is it? Hang on, have I got a filter on that? Hang on one second. This is going well, this. Uh, it has, it's got that colour correction filter on it. There we go. You can see it now. Can you? Yes, there you go. Yes, the Friday, the Factoria devs, Clone and Kovrex and uh, V, uh, the kind of the main crew, I believe, um, have posted a new Friday Facts. Friday Facts 367. And uh, it's got some information about the update. So I thought we'd I'd sort of read it through, basically. And plan is to, uh, for disclosure, plan, plan is to put this up on YouTube. But uh, I thought I might as well read it through now and give some thoughts if I've got any. <laughs> Not sure I'll have a lot. Uh, but um, just to go through it all and, and sort of see what they've said. Um, I have read it through, but very, very briefly. Uh, okay, so uh, obviously starts off with a bit of a, a sort of an apology. Hello, long time no talk. We've got some catching up to do. Indeed, it's um, been about a year, almost one year, Friday Facts. Uh, 365 we said we don't think that the expansion will take less than a year to develop well it has been less than a year and is not finished so we kept her word on that uh, anyone who was expecting it within a year was probably a bit misguided i think um you know the entire the game took nine years in early access before it was released so i don't think we'll be getting it well we'll come on to that in a minute but i, I think we'll be getting i think it's gonna be another year away um and, well, I say we'll get on to that. But while it might not be finished, there is still a lot we have done so far. Expansion news. We still don't... Uh, so we're down onto this section here. Uh, so we still don't have, want to be specific about many things, not even the expansion name. But we can start by giving you some general idea about the scale of the project. The general goal is to make the expansion feel like as big an addition as the whole vanilla game. This is why we plan to price it at $30 and put enough content to make it well worth the price. Now, typically, um, the main vanilla game takes about someone in a region, depending on how experienced you are, um, takes somewhere around 60 hours, I would say. Um, that's if you know sort of what you're doing, um, but you're you know, new to the game, so a newish player. Um, if you've been playing a lot, you can finish it. Well, the, the uh, there is a, a speed run, two speed run achievements. It can be finished in eight hours or fifteen hours, um, which I found surprisingly easy when I tried because I've got a couple thousand hours practicing. But a lot of people, it takes five hundred hours for their first launch. Now, I don't think they're referring to that. I think, as I say, they're talking about an expansion that will take somewhere in the region of a hundred hours, maybe, um, if you sort of have a couple of attempts at it and you don't quite know what you're doing with the new stuff. Honestly, making the price, and thus the expected scope, a little bit more concrete in this way, motivates us not only to make enough, but also to not overshoot, which is one of the things they were a bit chronic for last time, in that we got quite a few things added in during early access that I'm not sure we're really going to have a, a, a region in the original plan. So it sounds like they're trying to be a bit more... Um, uh, they're trying to avoid uh, feature creep and scope creep um, by the sound things, which is good. Um, so we wouldn't spend another nine years doing it. There you go. You see, it took nine years for the first early access version um, to hit 1.0. Generally, the fact that the team size has increased and there are a lot of things in the engine that we already solved should hopefully imply that the expansion takes way less time than the base game. So what they're basically saying is that they've got that concrete foundation of the base vanilla game. This also kind of confirms that the vanilla game isn't going to change. So, as I say, it's also confirmed later on. 
Um, so basically, you could play through the entire vanilla game without any real changes once the expan expansion has launched. Um, so it really is an expansion. It's not a doesn't sound like they're going to tweak it, tweak the vanilla version um, too much, basically. So that's that's quite interesting, and because that also suggests what it might be about, you see. And as I say I think the feeling in the community is it's probably space expansion um, as an official version rather than a mod. Seven step plan. Always good to have a plan. <laughs> step one, high level plan. We decided and planned the general topics of the expansion. This is and notes the past tense there. This is comparable to when we were deciding to add trains to the game. And he's using this as an example. I don't think this is equivalent to what we're getting. Um, but yeah, so when they decided to add trains to the game. We knew that we wanted to control how the intersections work and that it should act as the largest scale logistics option, but the details weren't laid out yet. So really is a high level plan of just, we want trains in the game. We want you to be able to do signals basically. Step two, basic shape. This is the step where we start to make the actual game objects, even when they don't even do anything at that point. So this is, I believe he's referring to, or they're referring to what you call gray box ob objects in the game, where they're just placeholder graphics and they're just things, entities, that logic can be attached to uh, for you in order to basically be able to play it very roughly. Uh, for the rail example, this would uh, mean that we make mock objects for rails, trains, train stops, and signals. So different people can start implementing the behavior in parallel. So basically a developer, um, oh, you can't see my cursor, that's not very good. So one developer might, you know, do the logic for rails, another might do the logic for trains, another might do the train stops, uh, and maybe the signals as well, or both of them. You might have multiple developers working on those in parallel. That's pretty common for soft modern software development. Um, uh, and start making it interact as they go. So uh, deciding our common architecture and, and, and sort of systems, which of course is kind of taken care of with the base game. So the types of changes that they would need to do would be modifications rather than discovering that the base game doesn't work properly because it's been pretty well tested by now. In this phase, as this things as things stop being as abstract, a lot of the most basic unexpected problems start to show. So this is basically saying, what that's saying is, you wanted to do signals, and you had an initial thought that that's how you were going to do them. You try them, and they don't work properly. Trains crash into each other, or no train moves, and, and those sorts of things. So um, that's the most basic unexpected problems, because your plan didn't work. And I say that is kind of modern software development. Implement step three, implementation of subsystems. The goal of this part is to give the individual mechanics and their object definitions into place, but they're usually the minimum necessary to test it. It's like implementing biter and spawn mechanics, but having just one type of biter, not connecting it to pollution and having no sense of balancing with the player's weapon system. So it's just literally some logic for biters that spawns them and um, uh, you know, creates a biter object, but that's literally, that could be represented by a grey square um, and a bigger grey square. You know, it has no real representation of how it will look, um, but it allows you to test behaviours. So does it spawn? How many does it spawn? Can you get it to spawn different numbers? Does it spawn in different locations? When it adds a biter nest onto the map, does it put it in the water or, you know, all these logical tests that you need to do, basically. Um, but in terms of, you know, it come, the player comes up against it, it might be so powerful that the, the player can't even kill it. Um, and so they, they're not ironing out those sorts of problems at that stage. Step four, connecting systems into a prototype. Uh, sorry, connecting systems into a prototype. Here, we put all the subsystems together and try to connect them. A lot of bigger structural problems can be discovered at this point, which might require some wild removals changes or additions required to make it all work together. So you basically put all of your bits together, all of your Lego pieces fit together, you discover that they don't fit properly and one of them sticks out and another one causes the entire Lego set to explode and you know all of your big all of your interaction problems start to appear in that phase. And this is the key bit. So they say this is where we are now in the expansion progress. Big parts of the game are playable, and we are approaching a state where we can play test from start to finish. So that sounds like they've got quite a long way. Um, 
However, there's a there's something called Pareto's principle. It's it's not a real thing, but it's basically sort of um, ninety percent of the um, or sort of the last ten percent of the effort takes ninety t last ten percent of the progress takes ninety percent of the effort, and that's what you tend to find with a lot of these things. It's relatively simple, uh, relatively. It's not simple, but it's relatively simple. Uh, to throw things together and create systems and subsystems and put them all into a big pot and sort of stir them together. What you then discover, as I say, is they don't work together properly. They don't work as intended. There's all sorts of bugs. There's all sorts of weird interactions. There's all sorts of broken bits. And all of that is the next phase, the first pass of tweaking. This part should feel much better as the content is more stable and the chance of removing things is lower. So. Uh, in step four, they dis they might discover well, you know, um, signals don't work at all and are just a bad idea and are just horrible. So they take them out altogether. That's a fairly extreme example, but um, they might also discover that they don't work properly and they need to go completely back to the drawing board and re redo them. The next step is step five: is once they've um, basically got those basic versions in place, they then do testing and they pass, you know, they they check to see if it works. Um, in more finer detail. So they've got what they think is the basic version, right? And then they and then they basically run it through and, you know, can we test this? Does it work? Does it function? Does it function as intended? Um, this is where we can actually have the semi-final list of requirements for the graphics department. So at this stage, it's all been grey box, you know, so the graphics haven't really been um, properly implemented because they've not decided there's no point creating a new graphical entity if you then decided you're just going to ditch it or it doesn't need to work like that or it doesn't need to look like that so this is where the graphics department get involved and the grey boxes start to become uh, actual uh, graphics and entities which allows us to start making reasonable time estimates graphics is always used well usually it's one of the biggest time sinks because Games are a graphical medium, basically, so uh, doing the graphics takes a long time. At this point, we do more playtesting and we can start polishing the roughest edges. This polishing is mainly focused on basic balancing. The biggest UX for, for issues, uh, UX stands for user experience, so how does it feel to do, how does it feel to play, sorry, uh, and to interact with it, broad pacing improvements, etc. When I come back to this parallel of the train implementation, I should move that up, so I'm on the way. Uh, this is, um, when I come back to the parallel of the train implementation, this is the phase where the trains are fully functional, but it's cumbersome to control them, so we need to improve the ways uh, way rails are built, provide the trains overview, improve the schedule editing, etc. So this is, you know, it's polishing. It's basically taking, right, we've got functional trains, but, as he says, if you get in it and try and drive in it, it's the controls are stupid and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't speed up very well and all these sorts of issues that you'd say well we need to make it feel like feel better and, and to play better basically um, this is kind of a loop where the implementation where we implement additional things based on the feedback from the previous loop of play, play testing this step is also waiting on graphics and we have also learned that UX improvements are not easy so it'll take a long time so basically this is what I was saying about the Pratos principle that you might think they've got a you know, a rough version. This is probably, this is almost the equivalent. Uh, in fact, no, it's probably earlier. So somewhere between these two would be the equivalent of the original uh, Factorio, um, you know, original um, early access version. So basically, you know, it's functional and it's got big bits of the, bits of the game in. The difference would be that they hadn't done these things. They knew the types, they'd done this, uh, but they haven't put everything in in a basic shape on the early access version. And it'll, I'll come on to that in a minute. But basically what he's saying is that they want it to be essentially a complete... Um, almost like if you launched a mod and it was the complete mod at the same time. I've sort of preempted something then. But, but yeah, it wants it to be, you know, the complete set of features. Maybe it'll change. Maybe they'll need to add something. Maybe they'll suddenly discover something that goes in. Um, but yeah, they want it to go in as, as a, a complete version, which I think is good, um, given where the game game is overall. Uh, beta test. At this point, most of the graphics... Oh, I say, you might think that it's worth releasing at this stage, but it covers that, or they cover that later on. 
Step 6 beta test. At this point, most of the graphics are in place and the game is fully playable. When the game feels close to finished, we can tweak the final details, like new simulation screens, tips and tricks, achievements and so on. Note the achievements there, so we're getting new achievements for the expansion. Which you usually do, but uh, that's quite interesting. We can also start to invite a limited number of players to help us find the most obvious bugs. So some kind, this would be um, like a proper closed beta test. Um, a lot of companies use beta tests basically as play as um, promotional activities nowadays. Uh, but that would that sounds like a proper beta test. It doesn't work properly, you know, and they know it doesn't, and there's no expectation that it will. Um, we w want to also invite some of the mod makers to help us test the modding API and let them prepare for the release. One of the best things I would say about Factorio uh, is its support for modding and, and their general attitude to modding. Um, I don't actually know how easy it is to program in Lua, but um, it seems to have a heck of a lot of support and, and encouragement uh, from the core team to do that, which is, I think, one of the best things about it. Um, same goes for our top community translators, proofreaders on Crowdin. Step 7, release. The tricky part is that we want to release basically direct to stable without an experimental phase, like when we released 1.0. The reason is the obvious problem we would have otherwise. An experimental release is not interesting to many people, but by the time it becomes officially stable, it is old news and nobody cares. Hopefully the focus on automated tests and beta testing should make it smooth enough. This sounds like, uh, to some extent, lessons learned from uh, the original Factorio um, you know, release. Um, Basically, what they're kind of saying is, and it was true, I mean, a lot of people don't play early access games. They won't play them. And there is that thing. It's a, it's almost like a form of, um, and this is a valid opinion. It's not one I fully agree with for indie games. But there's that thing of if it's being released in an early access version and you're paying for it, you're effectively paying to do beta testing. You know, you're pl playing a version that, you know, isn't for general consumption in a sense. Um, and you are paying to get early access to that, as the name suggests. But that means it's unfinished. Now, there is a, um, and not unreasonable, I would say, but an, an attitude that, you know, don't pay for games before they're released and that sort of thing. But for me, it's different for indie games. You know, I, I don't believe in that philosophy. I mean, don't get me wrong, it does lead into, you know, you can get abandonware and all those sorts of things where you know the devs just give up because it's not not been popular um or never intended to take it beyond a, an initial release and sort of conning people out of money so there are risks and you know if you're ever if you have any doubt of a personal nature um for you personally then you know don't do early access but i'm more than happy to do it i've <laughs> more than enough disposable income and, and more than enough stupidity so it, it's uh, something i'm more than happy to do but uh, i fully you know, appreciate the risks, basically. Um, but what it's basically saying is that it comes out, if particularly with Factorio, it was like an extreme example where it came out early access and it was in early access for, I'm not sure it was the nine years, it was like eight years, I think. And it was like two, a year and a half before it was even on Steam. Um, something like that. I don't know the exact timetable, but it meant that a lot of us had played it through over and over and over again. And that does tend to, particularly when it's functional, um, that does, does tend to mean that you sort of get into this situation where, and I know I felt it, they make changes, and this is what he's talking about, UX experiences. They make changes and um, the community reacts negatively to them. Um, <laughs> um, hello, Ultimate Blaze and Crazy Bacon. Welcome back both. <laughs> Walking out of my mind. And I, Ultimate Blaze. Um, just so, just to know, I'm doing this. I'm intending to basically chop this up and put it on YouTube. So I'll probably just straight read and then and then we can sort of chat through some of the things. I assume you're probably because of the, the news about the expansion rather than just general uh, awareness. Uh, but yeah. So I say basically, I think they learned this lesson from the original release. Basically, that if you put it out and it's there for years and years and years in early access. Basically, some people will forget about it or, you know, and then when you try and do your big launch, it's like that thing. Basically, there's a, I can't remember what the exact expression is, but it's you only get one launch, basically. Um, it's not quite true. There are lots of games that have come back, um, you know, to to 
unsuccessful like Rainbow Six Siege and all these sorts of things. But um, but yeah, it's sort of like I think they're trying to go for an approach that is right. You know, this is it. It's done. Maybe there's a day one patch and a month one patch and those sort of things. But it's a finished, complete product. Um, and I say partly as a reaction to to what happened with you know Factorio's very long development. Um, so thirty dollars is something. Yeah, it is. It is quite a price. I mean, for me personally, and I, I do appreciate a lot of people have different circumstances. Um, to me, this is basically ridiculously cheap, <laughs> in a sense that I mean I've literally played the game for I've forgotten it's three thousand hours. So the fact that I've only played played only paid a tiny amount of money and I know I do know a lot of people you know people's circumstances different that is a lot of money for a lot of people um, but you know that to me is um, cheap um, particularly if they're saying what they're saying about it being the same size as vanilla and as complex as vanilla um, which is quite a claim I'm not sure they'll achieve that in the time scales they're talking about because you know I mean they added nuclear to vanilla and they added so much stuff to vanilla to say it's going to be the same again, and it's only going to take a little bit of extra time, maybe not. Um, but yeah, to me, and I'm assuming what will happen is, because uh, I think the base game is $30, isn't it? So it will probably be like, if you buy the complete game, it'll be $50. Um, but for those of us who you know buy it as an expansion, it'll be $30. <laughs> 3000 I play 300 uh, I mean, this is, I mean, I think I've said this before, this is my, Fat Curry is my favourite game of all time. I've, you know, I've, that is my, um, it's almost my forever game. It's the game, if you gave me this game and that was it, I'd be happy, particularly with the mods. I mean, the mods make it um, a ridiculous value proposition. But, but yeah, I mean, $30 is a lot for an expansion for a game that is $30 in itself. Um, right then, so, uh, release strategy. Uh, the original plan of just releasing the expansion as a big update sounded very natural. We imagined that 1.1 would basically become completely stable and we wouldn't have to worry about it and just focus on the new versions. However, this proved to be uh, sorry, this proved to not actually be possible and maintaining both versions is just more work. On top of that, the huge refactors we made in our current master branch made the process of merging fixes and changes into 1.1 quite painful. Also, if we wanted to change anything structural, we would have to keep the migrations from 1.1 forever, and we would also need to support the 1.1 map version loading indefinitely. So, there's a little bit to unpack there. What they're basically saying is that the expansion is a different branch of the game. So the game we're all playing is 1.1, and the expansion is being developed in a... I don't think they call it a 1.2 there, but in a 1.2, basically. It's probably not called 1.2, it'll be 1.1 expansion. But they basically, all the refactoring thing they were talking about, about that, which came out of that, out of that controversial update, um, is basically um, all of that stuff is clearly in the branch, in the expansion version. It's not actually been put into the main game, which makes sense because there's not been a big patch saying we've completely reworked these things, which you would expect given what they were saying in that, that update, uh, that Friday Facts. So what they're going to do is they're basically going to take those core game changes and put them into a 1.2 version. Uh, and that will mean that when they do the expansion, all of that core stuff will be the same. Because, say, in terms of the development side of it, as in the core stuff, that's kind of... They've done a lot of that, by the sound of things. It's the next bit where they turn it into a fun fun game with good graphics and, whoops, and you know, all of that stuff. Uh, that, and that's going to take a while. That always takes a while. So yeah, so basically, the other thing is this bit, we would also need to support the 1.1 map version loading indefinitely. So basically, they've got a new way of loading in the map by the sound of things. Now, given if you've ever played on a really big map, um, it takes ages to load the map in, and it's really big. Um, so it sounds like they've come, they've redone that. Um. <laughs> um. Uh, did I read that? No, this leads to a different plan. We will release the 1.2 update to the base game, and the expansion will be based on the same version, and we will also contain the expansion mod. So they're basically 
well, ex executables will be slightly different, so you couldn't just install the expansion mod without having the expansion executable, but other than that, the code will be identical. So in other words, if, if somebody like rips off the expansion um, and turns it into a mod for the base version, it wouldn't work, basically, is what they're saying. <laughs> This has some very nice implementation implications. The expansion content will be just a mod that can actually turn off, so you can easily play a non-expansion playthrough if you want to. And I say that again tells us as well that the expansion stuff is completely independent. So um, if they add in, well, I suppose it could still work. But if what I was thinking is maybe there'd be new new minerals, so you, we might get it. Probably wouldn't be like aluminium, but you know, if we got new minerals or new, you know, new ores and stuff, that would be limited to the new items that got put in the game, is what I'm reading that to mean. It could be that you still needed them for the old stuff, so perhaps nuclear reactors needed some new super special mineral to make. And that it's just like a toggle, that when you turn on the expansion, it requires it. When you turn it off, it doesn't require it. Could be that. I doubt that, though. Because your production chains would all train, your production chains would all be different. So what I'm interpreting that to mean is that if there are new, um, and they're going to be, you know, new um, machines, new entities, new items in the game, um, those would either use the existing materials, so plastics and or you know, oil stuff, iron, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or if there are new materials in the game, new ores. They will be limited to the expansion stuff. So that's my rather heavy reading into... I'm sort of massively reading between the lines there. Um, since the versions are compatible, the expansion version connect, can connect to non-expansion multiplayer games by dis disabling the expansion mod. Again, tends to suggest that... Um, that I mean, that's even more interesting in that it ten that tends to suggest... Expansion version can connect to non-expansion multiplayer games. Yeah, so basically it sounds like if you turn off the expansion, all of the old stuff just works. So, you know, the new stuff is the new stuff, and it's separate completely to the old stuff and doesn't, in a sense, interact with it. Um, I can't quite believe that. I can't believe we're not getting, you know, level three mod uh, level five modules or, you know, things like that. That sounds like things we'll get, but it sounds like that they will be proper additions to the game. All the changes to the game, modding and scripting API, etc., will be done just once, so we don't have to keep two versions of Lua Docs, for example. Just a, a housekeeping one. Lots of the quality of life and other improvements we prepared for the expansion will just appear for everyone. So the expansion will be more strictly about the new content and mechanics. So this is almost like one of those when um, you get one of those free updates. So you do, you know, the uh, paradox is one of the. <laughs> Or might call worst for this, where they do, you know, we're doing a new version of Prison Architect or something, and it's got all these new things in it that you can pay for, but it also includes a bunch of new free content. So it sounds like that's effectively what 1.2 will be. So 1.2 will be different, I presume, fully compatible with previous versions, uh, you know, previous saves, etc. But I'm wondering, it's just interesting they refer to quality of life stuff, not just performance stuff. So it sounds like. Maybe, I don't know, something like Blueprints might have been tweaked or something like that. To be clear, the expansion will not be just a mod. I should move that up so I'm not covering over. Uh, to be clear, the expansion will not be just a mod. The game engine itself will have some significant improvements and technical backing to make many of the new gameplay features possible. These engine capabilities will be available with the expansion, build, executable, and will... And we will add a mod info flag like uses expansion pass features. That will mean the mod will try only try to load in the expansion. And this will also be used for other things such as mod portal filtering. So yeah, it sounds like, you know, the expansion will work fully and completely with the old version. But the old version will be, you know, one entity. The expansion stuff will be another set of, ent you know, another entity, another thing. The two will interact, but in such a way that... If you're just playing vanilla, you won't miss anything um, in the expansion. You know, you won't be getting, you won't be losing features, etc. Um, that you know, players will gain from the expansion that are in vanilla. So, in other words, as I say, you might, we might not get 
they might do a level five module, but um, you know the mere materials required to make it will you know won't impact the building of a level three module, if that makes sense. Right then, so this here, so graphics department, the requirements on Factorio graphics are often heavily rooted in the behavior and mechanics of entities. When a gameplay is just getting designed and tested, as we outlined in the plan above, changes and even removals are common. To avoid reworking or scrapping graphics, which take a lot of time and care to create, we try to work on things with the most solidified gameplay mechanics first, or improvements that don't change the mechanics at all. Now, this isn't how biters die, is it? I'm sort of... Because you don't... I don't tend to sit there and watch them decay. Not die, decay, basically. I don't think they do this at the moment. So what they're saying, I think, unless I'm very wrong, is this is new graphics. This is... So when he talks about uh, improvements that don't change the mechanics at all, this is improved gra graphics. I say, I may be misinterpreting that, but... Um, these carcasses are new. I think this is what essentially the graphics team has been working on while they wait for the mechanical changes to be done. So, for example, you know, if they're at this stage, you know, this is where they bring in graphics, basically. So, um, so yeah, and I say, I think these are new. They're quite gross, I would say. There's a lot of organs and stuff. If you look at this one... Oh, you can't see my mouse, can you? Um, but... If you look at the biters, particularly underneath the left-hand um, nest, this one here, there's a lot of like organs and stuff in this. Look at that, in this thing. It's all a bit horrible and gross, which is good because you know that's what you want them, want the aliens to be, I think. Uh, but yeah, and there's like structural pieces, almost like um, skeleton stuff in the nests. Um, I say I think these are new graphics, basically. But of course, it doesn't change the game by having these. Um, but yeah, very organic looking, anyway. Now, the next bit, the big reveal, or concept art for, of new stuff. So, this appears to be... Oh, I'll just finish that. We hope you enjoyed the small update, and can let us know what you think at the usual places. Yeah, so this appears to be... In fact, I'll make that a little bit smaller if I can, so it fits on the screen. Appears to be, unless I'm being very much stupid, a new biter. And it's not a biter. It's a what? I mean, that looks like a brain to me. Uh, and this is possibly like... I'm trying to... I'm pointing... Can I get my cursor? No, that didn't work. Uh, why is it not capturing my cursor? Hang on a sec. Uh, Maybe it's in settings. Ah, there we go. Capture cursor. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so at the top here, I mean, I can zoom in on it, but it doesn't make a lot of difference for you guys because I just have to zoom out in order to see it sort of thing. So it is a big image then. Um, yeah, so at the top here, I mean, basically, it's some kind of like um, jellyfish, I would say. It's modeled on a jellyfish. Particularly, possibly, a man of war, a uh, Portuguese man of war. Um, I don't know what, I don't know if that's the official name for them or not, so I may not <laughs> I never know what that is. Um, but basically, man of war's like the purple one, the big purple floating thing on top, and then it has really, really, really long tentacles. Um, and it's, leaf it's basically fatal for humans if you get stuck. Or oh, I think it is, that may be a myth, but. If you get stung by a Japanese man of war, that's uh, right, Portuguese man of war, it basically will kill you. Uh, but yeah, so we got a jellyfish, I would say, struck, you know, idea. It's clearly a flying enemy. So is that a more wider hint that we're going to get flying biters? Possibly. Um, but I would say from the fact that this has a big brain in it, right? Um, I would say these these things down the bottom are probably like meant to be sensor organs. Um, some kind of sensors. We've got a ring here that I would say is like equivalent of an eye. Um, you know, possibly a visual sensor. These are perhaps, you know, touch, uh, taste type sensors, smell type sensors. Um, obviously, we've got tentacles. 
Um, one, two, three, four, five. I think there's six tentacles, so that's interesting. Uh, and then we've got these like grabbing, clawy, you know, tent. Uh, um, what should we call it? Um, hook type talons on it. Um, so it looks like it will have some kind of offensive capability. Uh, will be a dangerous entity. But to me, with this being a big brain, now it could just be it's because that's gross and that would be fine. But I'm wondering if this is perhaps a queen biter? Maybe something along those lines? Or perhaps maybe something like, uh, you know, in Warhammer where the... Um, well, Warhammer 40k where the... Um, uh, what they call tyrant tyranids tyranids uh, they have the the larger tyranids that uh, effectively act as control entities for the smaller the griblies um so i'm wondering maybe it's something like that the fact it's a big brain could maybe i mean if we're going nuts it might be some kind of psychic effect or it could just be a equivalent of a psychic power and it has maybe a laser blast because uh, in terms of attacks uh, we've got a melee biter We've got a projectile biter, so that's sort of equivalent to, um, you know, normal sort of combat. You could have it an equivalent. It could do a like a, a like a, a brain blast where it's like a, a laser beam almost, so equivalent of the laser turrets maybe. Um, or it could do something to the player, disorientate you, something like. I hope not, to be honest with that one. That seems a bit. Um, a bit too Starcraft to be honest with you, but um, but yeah, I say the fact it's a big brain suggests it's intelligent in some way. So it could be a control entity, it could be the Queen Biter, you know, or King Biter, I guess. Um, but yeah, very interesting. These I think are basically so this is like propulsion jets. I think this is basically saying how it gets around is by sort of pushing itself around with gas gas jets basically. Um, of course, it's a concept art, so it may never never even reach the game. But if they say they've already done a lot of the coding, it suggests they've put this entity in some form into the game. Um, so, yeah. Um, obviously, with it being a flying biter, that's a lot, a lot of people have requested things like that. So that, you know, they can fly over your walls and attack, the, attack your base, and you've got to defend your base properly, not just have a big wall. Um, or at least you need some kind of aerial defense, you know, anti-air guns or, or something like that. Um, if it can fly, can it also cross water? Can it fly across water and attack us from that direction? Um, but of course, it could just be a represent. You know, it could just be a. It flies, but it's not really. It's not a new en enemy type, other than as I say, if it's say a big, you know, mother biter, as it were, um, then you've got you know one or two of them in the game. Um, and they just, you know, they're just hovering there, a great big blob that you've got to kill. Um, it does make the qu question if it is that, um, what effect would that have? If you killed it, killed one, does it, you know, does it stop the biters from attacking you or something? Um, you know, the other option is it's just a new type of biter, um, and, you know, it's just a different biter that they can spawn, um, and, uh, you know, just attacks by air um so yeah it's horrible i would say <laughs> it's really gross um which is again is good um let's say you've got all these nasty claws so it could it could be another like melee attack you know it floats up to you and grabs you you know um but yeah it's interesting that that's what they've chosen to show anyway uh, and then it's all dripping dripping saliva lovely Yeah, so I, I don't know if anyone in the chat's got any thoughts or questions or <laughs> things to speculate about. Well, that was my thoughts on it, basically. I say I'm really pleased that, first off, that they have um, they have given us some news. Um, it had gone really quiet, um, like it's almost scarily quiet, um, particularly given that, um, you know, Friday Effects 365 is basically a, a run of 365 weeks of them putting out, you know, updates on the game and the state of the game. So to go a complete year with total silence was was getting a bit worrying, actually. Um, I kind of didn't doubt that it would it would happen, but there's always that possibility that they, they suddenly go, actually, no, we're not doing this. We're doing Factorio 2 or something like that, which wouldn't have any problems with any of that. But uh, I say it was a bit sort of um, 
bit, bit of a long time to go with no news whatsoever. Um, whether we'll get regular updates now, I don't know, but um, but yeah. I'm assuming, as I say, this will be a closed beta. Uh, whether and who would get to uh, partake in the beta is sort of an interesting question. Um, implication is they're expecting um, some players to, to be involved. Um, I suspect it will probably be the more active and more... Um, how to put it? More involved uh, mods, uh, uh, mod mod developers, not mods. Um, you know, we'll get to have a, a, a go on it and and break it, basically. <laughs> Probably because what will happen is they'll delve into the code and sort of say, "Well, this is this is broken and that sort of stuff," and here's how you fix it. <laughs> um, but yeah, re really, strat strategy is interesting. Um, as as was as you were mentioning earlier. Um, thirty dollars um, is is quite a quite a lot for a mo it's a lot a lot a lot for an expansion that for a game that only costs that in the first place you know um, to base it's equivalent of say you release a sixty dollar game um, and then your first expansion is a sixty dollar expansion proportionally is quite quite heavy um, you would typically expect expansions to be less but then in my personal opinion. It's underpriced, uh, the main game. Uh, again, I, I fully appreciate I'm coming at it from a particular perspective and, and, not, and a lot of people don't have that sort of money. Um, but for me, from a value point of view, um, it's just, you know, I've, I've literally paid pit fractions of a penny per hour of gameplay. Um, and it doesn't doesn't seem right that that's, you know, I can't, I can't play a bit more. Um, and say, I know they're like um, philosophically opposed opposed to micro transactions, which which is fine. But um, it'd be good to be able to just you know buy something and and sort of show a bit of sport. I already got the um, which is what's playing in the background actually the um, uh, soundtrack, uh, which is another thing. I don't know if we're going to get another more more songs, more tracks for the um, for the expansion. Um, but I'd certainly welcome a few more. I'm really a big fan of the, the soundtrack. Uh, what else is there? Yeah, I say, I mean, my speculation for what it is is pretty much, I think, in line with most people's, that uh, it is a uh, space-type expansion. Um, I mean, these would work well in space, wouldn't they? I mean, you know, if it's a jet-propelled fighter, um, you know, you could imagine it floating along in space. Um, but yeah, I think it is most like because it's the most logical thing, you know. At the end of Factorio, you you launch a rocket, so the notion of at least going to another planet or going to a moon or going to an orbital platform or um, asteroid belt, um, another star, all of those things make complete sense given the goal of the game uh, is to launch a rocket. Um, ultimately, one of my favourite like uh, uh, mods conceptually and I don't actually know if this is where space X which one is it space exploration space expansion um, uh, does actually go in the end but there was a, a mod I think it was space expansion that one was called where you built basically a a system for taking you home so it was like a faster than light um, portal thing uh, it didn't really have any functional implication in implementation of the game it was um, purely uh, purely sort of um, it was basically a way of having gigantic science but um, uh, you know requirements but um, doing that properly so that the goal of the game game became to properly go home and there was a, a sort of end point to it um, you know, would would make sense, and and if you're going to do that, because in a set, you know, this is always one of the things I've said about Factorio. You launch a rocket, you know, the game tells you at the start you've crash landed, and you need to get home. You launch a rocket, you can get on. I, I think you get on that record. I can never remember, but um, but you send this rocket off, and what does that do exactly? All right, it's got a satellite in it, but what does that achieve? <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't really do anything for you. Uh, and give you space science, which is just a that you know way of continuing the game. Um, so yeah, so so that's my sort of uh, rundown. So I'm, my plan 
So full disclosure is just to edit this down a little bit for and stick it up on YouTube tomorrow, um, just as a run through um, for people who haven't seen it or uh, want to have a look. Um, but yeah, so I say unless there's anything any, anyone wants to chat about, I'm going to switch over to, and this is a new one for me. I've never really done this before. <laughs> Or, or lots of firsts today. Um, I'm going to switch over to Dyson Sphere program. So, um, I say, unless anyone's got anything they want to chat about in particular, um, that's my sort of thoughts on it. Um, and uh, we'll pick up uh, on DSP. After a glass of water first, then. I should say thank you all for. <laughs> Coming back and, and welcome to the stream. So I'm trying to do that in a bit of a way that I can edit it down properly, but um, you never know with Twitch and YouTube, I bet it, bet it goes nuts when I try and do that. <laughs> 